Okay, thank you. Um, it's my real great pleasure and honor to introduce our, our um, in, very important speaker today, um, Professor Kerry Emanuel, who is a Cecil and Ida Green Professor in Atmospheric Sciences at MIT, and also co-director and actually co-founder of the Lorenz Center, which is named after Ed Lorenz. Um, he was named back in 2006 as one of the Times 110, 100 most influential people in 2007 was elected to the Academy of Sciences and has received a number of awards, including the Rosby Award of the AMS, the highest, highest, highest recognition of the AMS. Um, he has particularly specialised in the study of atmospheric convection and its impacts on, uh, and, uh, on um, various kinds of weather storms, and especially in hurricanes has written much about what to expect with respect to storm changes in the warming world. And his talk today obviously will be uh, kind of along that theme. So we really look forward to uh, hearing from Kerry. It's a great honor to have him here and um, hopefully he'll visit us again some other time in the future. Now, um, this obviously, as you realize, this has been recorded. Um, so questions at the end, please hold your questions until we can get the mics to you so that we can hear the questions and they're recorded. So um, just hold off and you, before asking questions so the mic gets to you. So with that, I'd like to welcome Kerry and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Graham. It's uh, really wonderful to be with all of you here this morning. Uh, it's particularly wonderful for me coming from Boston. I, all the, the neurons that are responsible for processing the color green are screaming at me. <laughs> because they've been forcibly taken out of their six-month holiday, what normally would be one. So it's, it's nice to be here. So um, spring is, uh, in the United States, severe storm season. And I thought it would be appropriate to talk to you a little bit about the problem of severe thunderstorms. If you don't know exactly what a severe thunderstorm is, don't worry. I will be ta telling you a little bit more about the definition of that. But they're the kinds of storms that produce violent weather, like hail storms and tornadoes. And, um, one of the things that we would like to know that we know almost nothing about right now is how the activity of such weather might respond to climate change. And we're, as a community, we're just getting into the subject, so I find it very exciting. I hope some of you do as well. And I'm going to be uh, talking to you today mostly about the PhD thesis work of my former student, Vince uh, Agard who received his degree last summer and is actually working at a small firm here in Los Angeles. So um, what I want to do is to start off talking about more generally about convection and to see where what I'm calling severe convective storms fits into the whole rubric. So um, some of these terms, I'm afraid, are for the uh, more um, specialist audience, but there's something we call quasi-equilibrium convection. It's a fancy term. The whole notion of quasi-equilibrium was actually invented by a professor at UCLA back in the 1970s. And it's just a term for convection that's more or less in statistical equilibrium with what's ever driving it. So what I like to think of is boiling water. You know, if you have a pot of boiling water and you turn up the heat, it boils harder. And your boiling is always at a rate that removes the heat at about the rate it's applied. So that's the definition of it. It's convection that consumes the energy that's available for convection at the rate that's being supplied. Um, and uh, most convection in the tropics, which is what we call benign convection, it doesn't produce a lot of extreme weather most of the time. And convection you see over continents in the summertime uh, is a convection of this nature. Um, it's responsible for a significant fraction of rain across the planet. And um, that's contrasted with the kind of convection I'm going to tell you about today, which mostly, which we might call stored energy convection. It's a remarkable feature of moist convection that doesn't have any analog in ordinary convection like boiling water that you can actually build up energy behind a potential barrier, just like in a chemical reaction. And it's sort of stored, as in a stick of dynamite, and then something triggers it, and you get an explosion or a sudden release of that energy. That's the kind of um, convection that causes problems. So the energy builds up over a long period of time, and it's suddenly released. It's comparatively rare. In most parts of the world, we'll never see this kind of convection. 
and it's responsible, on the other hand, for most problems that we pin on convection tornadoes, hailstorms, certain kinds of flash floods, and strong straight line winds. So just to, to go back now to the quasi-equilibrium convection, this is a photograph taken on one of the Seychelles Islands um, some years ago. And this is a very typical kind of tropical skyscape that you will see examples of if you go into any kind of travel agency in Boston in January to try to lure you to go to some far off exotic place. And it's always convecting in these parts of the world. Um, and the convection is weak. Uh, it produces a lot of rain, and it's complex. Um, you can see that if you wanted to do radiative transfer through a skyscape like that, you have lots of problems, and you can come and talk to Graham about that. That's his specialty. Now, when we look at the atmosphere in which convection like this occurs, we see profiles like this. So let me tell you a little bit about what this is that you're looking at. This is a uh, uh, profile of temperature uh, it's slightly different from temperature. I'll get back to that in a minute. It's a function, really, of altitude. Now, in atmospheric science, we use pressure, which decreases upward as kind of a proxy for altitude. So this is really pressure. This is temperature. And this is made by a weather balloon, OK? This is a particular um, sounding from an island in the equatorial tropical Pacific. And it's very typical of what you see there. There's this green line, too. That's the dew point temperature. Now, this red line shows not the actual temperature, but the temperature which is in slightly tweaked so that it reflects the variable water content of the air in a way so that you can basically calculate the density if you know this quantity and the pressure. So the temperature um, is not on vertical coordinates, but on these skewed black lines. So the temperature here is minus 30 degrees C. That's minus 40 degrees C, et cetera. If you want to know why we put it on a non-orthogonal axis, you can ask. That's a very uh, interesting bit of uh, meteorological history. And so the temperature declines up to the tropopause. And here are around 100 of these units, millibars or hectopascals. And then it's uh, slightly increasing with height in the stratosphere. So this is the stratosphere. This is the troposphere. Now, with a diagram like this, which is effectively a thermodynamic diagram, we can do little exercises. So we can take a sample of air from near the surface here, and we can lift it adiabatically, including uh, accounting for the phase change of water. And the problem is we don't know exactly how to do this, because, for example, uh, you, one extreme is to go up something called a pseudo-adiabat. That's this red dashed line. And the assumption there is that as soon as water condenses into a liquid or solid phase, there's some demon in that sample air that just removes it. That's called a pseudo-adiabatic process. The other extreme, these dark blue dots, is a reversible adiabatic process where all the condensed water stays in the sample as a suspended condensate. Now, it's a remarkable feature of nearly all tropical soundings, and for reasons we don't really understand, that a sample lifted from near the lower boundary up along one of these tropical soundings, the reversible adiabat lies along the sounding itself. And what that means is that if you take a sample there from here and lift it here, its density temperature will be the same as the environment. It won't have any buoyancy at all. So it's neutral. It doesn't want to accelerate upward or downward. Whereas if it went up a pseudo adiabat, it would be slightly positively buoyant. And our interpretation of tropical soundings, and in fact, in the quasi-equilibrium theory of convection is that convection is so efficient at removing instability that it renders the atmosphere neutral to convection. It's very similar to saying that if you observed a pot of fresh water boiling, you know, you would, you would guess, probably almost certainly correctly, that its temperature is 100 degrees centigrade, no matter how hard it's boiling. Temperature will go up to 100. The boiling is so efficient at, at, at taking heat out of the system that it just hangs at that critical temperature. This is a similar thing. It's like a self-organized critical state. The convection is so efficient that it just doesn't allow the atmosphere to become unstable. Now, on the other hand, uh, the convection I'm going to talk about today, which you might call stored energy convection, uh, the skyscapes, just to the eye, are very different. Now, when you see something like this coming, 
you know that you're looking at something qualitatively different from what you see ordinarily in the Seychelles Islands or in Florida or someplace like that. It just looks different. Um, this is a kind of convection that it's, it's pretty scary looking. I've been out there and filmed this sort of thing. Um, and it's the kind of convection that produces phenomena like tornadoes. So this is the convection that'll kill you if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, is that just a, um, a violent extreme of a continuum of convection of the tropical kind, or is it something qualitatively different? And we've been sure for many decades that the, it's really the latter is true. And the reason we can say that, and by the way, I should say that um, from a practical standpoint, the phenomena that accompany this kind of convection, like tornadoes, they kill 60 people per year on average in the US and cause about $400 million in damages. And hail, large hail like this, which causes about a billion dollars a year in damages to the US, mostly to agriculture. So this is of practical concern as well. Now, when we look at soundings, uh, we see something quite different. So this is the same kind of plot that I showed you before, but it's a different place in time. It's Norman, Oklahoma, which is in the center of Oklahoma. If you go there, you can get a t-shirt that says that Norman is not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> and I've seen it. <laughs> and if you look carefully, one thing you'll notice that's very important is this kink in the sounding down here. Again. Don't worry too much about this green line. This is the dew point temperature. But you see that there's a little layer here in which uh, not too far above the ground, this is about a kilometer and a half or two kilometers above the ground, uh, the temperature profile is briefly isothermal. And it goes to a very steep lapse rate. OK, now if we um, subject this to the same kind of exercise that we did with the tropical sounding, doesn't even matter which of these uh, pseudo-adiabatic or reversible processes you assume. The air, uh, you have to look very carefully. If you lift this sample up to here, it's actually slightly negatively buoyant. It doesn't want to go up. It wants to accelerate downward. And that makes it stable. But if you can lift it beyond this point, called the level of free convection, it will become positively buoyant. That is, its density temperature is higher than that of its immediate environment, and it will accelerate upward, OK? And so this is uh, something that can happen. This little cap, if you will, um, prevents the convective instability from being released. And when it is released, you can have, in the meantime, build up a lot of energy to, um, to drive that convection. Now, it turns out that um, if you sort of look at this generically, you can define this quantity, which is very important to this talk, called the convective available potential energy, or CAPE. It's the energy per unit mass uh, of, uh, released by a sample that's lifted from some specific place up along an adiabat. And it can be shown to be on a diagram in which you have temperature on one axis and log pressure on the other. It can be shown to be proportional just literally to the area between that adiabat that the sample goes up and the environmental sounding. So this area here uh, is proportional to the convective available potential energy. This area here, which is sometimes called the negative area, literally has a negative sign, is likewise proportional to the potential energy you need to break this barrier. This whole uh, thing down here is called convective inhibition. So uh, it's very different. It's not in any kind of equilibrium state. If you took a photograph of the sky when this sounding was taken, it would be a clear sky, maybe with some very low clouds. Uh, there's all this energy that's being stored up and at some point to be released. And that's why you can get these very violent uh, convective storms. Now, if we apply that to this particular sounding, which I just showed you, um, this one has a convective available potential energy of about 6,900 joules per kilogram. If you converted all that into the velocity of the updraft, it'd be 110 meters per second. That you do not want to fly United Airlines through 110 meters per second, I'll tell you that, or any, anyone else, okay? That's a violent updraft. We have measured velocities almost that large in severe convective storms. So then the whole point is, is how do you get soundings like this in the first place? 
Now, one clue, okay, is just looking at the climatology of severe convective weather. I'm going to first show it to you on a U.S. scale. This is simply a chart, it's a little confusing to look at, that shows uh, the number of days that uh, a particular place experienced hail of at least one inch in diameter. So very, uh, very big hailstones which accompany severe weather. You notice that this belt here in the sort of plain states from Texas all the way up to the Dakotas and extending eastward through the Midwest and part of the South has a lot of these uh, severe storms. Now, one thing that's interesting is notice there's not much going on in Florida, okay? Florida, on the other hand, you don't see it in this chart, has the most number of thunderstorms per day of any state in the United States. A lot of thunderstorms, but it's of the first kind, quasi-equilibrium, not much uh, by way of hail or tornadoes there. Um, they're all in this region. Now, what's so special about that place? Um, here's another kind of proxy for severe weather. It's just the number of these are significant or sufficiently strong tornadoes greater than something called F2 on the Fujita scale per century. And it's the same kind of pattern. It's the South, the Midwest, and, and the Plain states that experience these in overwhelm numbers. And again, not much going on in Florida, where you actually have more thunderstorms. Now, we know from lots of very interesting work that's been, been done in the last three or four decades what we need to get severe thunderstorms. One of the ingredients, and the one I'm going to focus on exclusively today, is this cape, which I've just talked about. There is another one that you have to be conscious of. You need to have a background wind, large-scale wind associated with weather systems that is varying quite rapidly with height, particularly near the surface. All right, we call that wind shear. And uh, you don't see it in the tropics. So even if you had a lot of cape in the tropics, you probably wouldn't have much severe weather. You need both of these ingredients. But I'm going to focus on the first. Now, the classical explanation, if you ask people, or if you're so unwise as to read my textbook from 1994, the classical explanation is that these kinds of soundings with this cap arise from the superposition of two streams of air. One coming uh, in the springtime from the Gulf of Mexico, which is cool but very humid air. And then over that, air uh, whose properties were, were molded, if you will, of the deserts of the southwestern US, uh, Mexico, and so forth. And that, that inversion at the low levels I showed you really marks the boundary between these two air masses. So you're taking high entropy uh, but cool air putting it under hot but dry and low entropy air. And that's how we always thought that you build up these states of high energy. And we've since concluded that's probably wrong, OK? But that's the textbook understanding at the moment. So let's look at the distribution of tornadoes on the global scale. Uh, so this is not very quantitative. It's tornadoes in the period 1930 to 1985. I'm quite sure that this is not very accurate quantitatively, but it shows you the regions. The red dots are reports of tornadoes. We've been talking about the US. The green shading, and I always wondered why they put this on this map, I don't have any idea, is showing you areas which are generally agricultural. And the fellow who wrote this paper was trying to make the point that tornadoes seem to like agricultural areas. Maybe he thought cows caused, caused tornadoes. I don't know. <laughs> but um, there is an interesting correspondence. And I always looked at that map and said, what a weird map that is. You know, why put that down? We also know that tornadoes occur in, in the plain states where they're farmed. So what? OK. And uh, it never occurred to me until recently that maybe there is something physical behind that. And it's not cows. OK, but uh, let's see if that's true. Another clue comes from the diurnal variation of tornadoes. So this is for the US. This is ours. It should be in local time. It's just central standard time. It's close. This is the number of tornado reports by the hour of the day in which they occurred. And as you probably are aware, they're phenomena of the afternoon and early evening. They don't tend to occur very often in the early morning. So sunlight is an important ingredient in this mix. So I would say that based on what you've seen so far, there are key questions. What determines the geographical distribution of this kind of convection, the stored energy convection? I want to emphasize, again, it's rare. It's not common. 
Why do they peak in the afternoon and early evening? Why are the key, uh, uh, peak values that we see when we look at many thousands of soundings in sort of the neighborhood of 3,000 to 6,000 joules per kilogram? What sets that number? How does that number change with climate? And yeah, how, how do we expect that to change with climate? Are we going to get more tornadoes or fewer going forward? Um, how do we actually even address that question? Uh, so um, what we hit upon, uh, it's sort of phrased as a hypothesis here, is that it's something quite different from what we had imagined, that you get these large amounts of energy when you take a deep desert air mass with a very steep gradient of temperature with altitude, um, and it's dry, it has almost no water in it coming from the desert, and you advect it not over moist air, the key difference in this hypothesis is you advect it over moist soil, okay? That was the big thing uh, that we sort of stumbled on that changed the way we thought about this. It has to do a lot with how wet the soil is, okay? And then you turn on the sun. So the recipe to get a lot of cape is you start with a deep, dry, adiabatic desert air mass, and you move it over a moist soil, and you turn on the sun, basically. And so what we did was to build a very simple model of that process. So we're going to take this box, and it extends from the surface to a very high altitude. We're not going to actually say how high it is. It's not necessary. And we're going to idealize the initial state of the atmosphere in this box. Think of this as a one-dimensional atmosphere as, as having basically this property of a dry desert air. For the atmospheric sciences in the room, this will be characterized by a constant dry static energy, which is this quantity here. The moist static energy, since there's no water in this initial state, happens, which is the same thing, but with this term added, which is proportional to the concentration of water vapor Q, in the initial condition is identical, because there is no moisture. And we take this dry surface, and we put some solar radiation solar plus infrared radiation into the soil. That's going to be, it's going to be kind of an initial value problem where we start with the desert air we, um, that's been formed over a dry surface, and then we move it over a moist surface. We just plunk it down over a wet surface. Everything else is the same. And we turn on the radiation and we watch what happens. Now, um, and we use boundary layer theory, a relatively primitive form of it, to to determine quantitatively. So what happens is that um, the air, of course, right in contact with the soil is moistened and cooled by that uh, interaction because, of course, when you evaporate water, you cool the air. So it gets moister and cooler. And um, as you heat the soil, you get a, a heat flux from the soil and the air. That drives dry convection in the air. That is convection that doesn't have phase change of water. Some of that convection impinges on the top of this boundary layer, and we've known those physics for quite a long time. That serves to entrain into it this hot, dry air from above. So the boundary layer grows with time, entraining this dry but warm air into itself. And as it does so, we can calculate basically this convective available potential energy of this moist air lifted hypothetically into this dry air aloft. So I'm going to go through this part very quickly because it will only be interesting to the specialists. So this is going to go flashing by, and the specialists can talk to me about it afterwards. But basically, we have very simple one-dimensional boundary layer equations for the conservation of dry static energy. So this is the dry static energy of the boundary layer, whose depth is h, which changes in time, the surface sensible heat flux, and then the entrainment with velocity we of air from above. Similar equation for the moist static energy. This is now the net surface radiative flux. Um, we use a very simple formulation of entrainment, which says an entrainment uh, potential energy to do the entrainment comes from the surface sensible heat flux. It's all dry convection. And we formulate the surface fluxes according to some aerodynamic flux formulas with a specified wind speed and uh, same for the surface latent heat flux. The one thing I want to emphasize is we're putting this little artificial coefficient alpha 
which is going to be our proxy for soil moisture. And it's very important. So when alpha is zero, there's no latent heat flux. The soil is totally dry. When alpha is one, it's as though it were an ocean surface. It's completely wet. And we just vary it continuously between zero and one. It's not really soil moisture, but it, it's a function of soil moisture. And then the net surface uh, energy flux is the sum of the sensible and latent, and then the boundary layer has to conserve mass. And so that's what the model is. It's very simple. And again, in the spirit of not getting too hung up on the equations, this is so the atmospheric people can, can ask me later about it, really. We, uh, well, one other thing I have to say is that the boundary condition on the moist static energy is strictly related to the dry static energy by the clausius clapeyron equation. That's easy. And then we have to put in initial conditions, which is that the initial moist static energy in this thin boundary layer is equal to the dry static energy above it. And we determine the initial dry static energy of the boundary layer so that the air at the top of the boundary layer initially is just saturated. We non-dimensionalize things. Again, I'm skipping through. And we, this is really the set of equations we solve. There's only one equation we have to solve numerically. So you can do this on a hand calculator. This is not a supercomputer model, all right? And everything else is diagnostic from there. Um, now, this is one thing I do want to spend a little bit of time on, is that uh, it turns out from the equations themselves, you can deduce uh, for certain, under certain conditions, a long time behavior. That is, if you just turn on the sun and leave it on, what do you get in the long run? Now, there are two regimes. One, this is the basically a function, a nonlinear function of the temperature of the soil initially. Uh, and if it's less than some, this net radiative flux into the soil, you're in one regime, and, the, and this available potential builds up over time, and then it goes back down again. Whereas if you're in the other regime, this uh, energy uh, builds up and then asymptotes to a constant at long time. And you can work out what that is. And again, I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, in this model, the convective available potential energy is just proportional to the difference between the moist and dry, uh, static energy of the boundary layer and the initial dry static energy. And the long-term asymptotic behavior in this regime this is the interesting result, is this. So it says that in this simple model, at any given time, well, I guess I should say at long time, this cape um, is given by this expression. That's the only one I'm going to go through in detail, because it's important. This is the latent heat of vaporization. This is the saturation water content of the soil, which is Basically, well, it is the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. So it's an exponential function of how hot the soil is. And then on the negative side, we have the net radiative flux into the soil divided by the large-scale surface wind that's going on during this time and a bunch of constants. And this yeah, you can consider to a good approximation just to be a constant here. This is the important term. It says that cape, peak cape, under this regime scales with the clausius clapeyron equation. So if you make the climate warmer, CAPE goes up, and it goes up fast. All right, And you're going to see that when I actually show you the solution to this model. Um, and it will be larger for lower values of the radiative flux and larger values of the wind speed. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm going to look at these two regimes. Actually, there are three. Uh, or one sub-regime of the second regime. This is the depth of the boundary layer versus time. This is a particular solution of this model for a particular starting temperature and radiative flux. These are all non-dimensional except for the uh, initial depth of the boundary layer here. The boundary layer grows slowly, slowly, and slowly, and at a certain time it just blows up. It goes to infinity, and that's it. You have to stop the calculation. This is the... Um, Dry static energy, you think of that as the temperature of the boundary layer. Um, this is the uh, moist static energy of the boundary layer. And then this is the temperature of the lower soil surface here. So it goes up. It reaches a peak. All of these things reach a peak, and they go back down. And the same thing with the convective available potential energy. It reaches a peak at a certain time, and then it goes to zero. 
In the warm regime, something different happens. Um, the boundary layer depth goes up, and instead of blowing up, it just goes into a regime where it simply linearly increases with time. Now remember, we're turning the sun on, and we're leaving it on. There is no sunset. So this is like a British Empire model, right? <laughs> um, all right, and so this is now the moist stack energy again. The temperature of the air in the boundary layer, which is this blue curve, and the temperature of the surface itself. And they all asymptote constants, as does the cape, although not before first reaching a peak. Then it goes down, but it doesn't go to zero. It sort of asymptotes to something that's nearly constant. And then if you make it warm enough, um, the only thing that's slightly different is that instead of reaching a peak and coming down to a constant, it just asymptotes to a constant without first reaching another peak. So if you make it really hot, uh, then you get slightly different behavior this way. Um, now, if we just compare these curves of cape versus time for different initial soil temperatures, this is cold, blue, this is now you know, it's 290 degrees Kelvin, this is 295, 300, and so forth, you can see that the cape, peak cape values increase rapidly. This is the cold regime, so these all come to zero, but these two guys don't go to zero, okay? But they reach much larger peak values as you increase the temperature of the system. Um, and this is just showing you the relationship between the initial surface temperature in the model and peak values of CAPE. This is on a log scale here, so it's going up slightly super exponentially with temperature, which is basically what the clausius clapeyron equation does. Now, the problem with this is the British Empire problem. The sun is always shining, and that's not reality. So we're going to do the next best thing. We're going to let it go for 12 hours and turn it off. No, we don't have a nice sine curve. We just turn it on, and then we turn it off after a certain time. Uh, so these are the same kinds of curves I showed you before. And then qualitatively, what we're going to do is just shut down the system, turn off the sunlight at some particular time. And then we're going to pick off what the peak value of CAPE is, either before that time or at that time, as the case may be. Um, and then we get this uh, slightly different kind of curve of maximum CAPE within this diurnal period as a function of the surface temperature. And it goes up, but instead of continuing to go up exponentially, what's happening is the hotter you make it, the longer it takes to actually reach the peak value. And so you, you haven't hit the peak value by the time the sun sets, and the sunset up here is determining the peak value is still going up, but it then kind of levels off like this. And we can do, we can look at this. This is really interesting. This is just varying the surface wind speed, which is specified in this model, from low values to high values and looking at this, how this, um, I'm sorry, this is wrong. I'm not varying wind speed. I'm fixing that. And I'm changing the soil moisture from low values in red. I don't know why. I'd, did low, red, and high blue, but anyway. And so wet soil. So you can see at any given temperature, you get somewhat more cape if you start, uh, you, if you put this dry column over a moist soil, OK? So, so the soil moisture, this is a theme I want to come back to again. And it's where this laboratory might actually be able to help us, I think, is how important the soil moisture is in this problem. Um, now, this is um, varying, this is what I thought the first graph was at first, but this is varying the wind speed with fixed soil moisture. And this just shows that all other things being equal, you're going to get more cape if you have higher surface winds. The surface wind determines the partition between how much of the solar heating is going into latent heat flux versus a sensible heat flux. OK, now the other thing that Vince did, which I think is interesting, is does this have anything to do with the real world? I mean, we're, going from, we're starting with a very simple model, a simple idea. And so what he did is he went to the archive of severe storm reports in the United States, which is more complete than in any other country, and looked for cases where you had severe weather. So these dots indicate these are for different days. Uh, you can see the dates here. These dots are showing you where on that day there was severe weather, okay? 
And on the, and the corresponding panels on the right-hand side show, based upon weather balloon type soundings and other information, the actual distribution of convective available potential energy at roughly the time that these storms occurred. And so you can see there's a correspondence. So you get severe weather where there's high cape. Uh, the converse isn't always true. You don't, just because you have high cape, you don't get severe weather. But it's very hard to get severe thunderstorms without high cape. And that just shows that. It's not, no big surprise. And these peak values are in the neighborhood of three to 6,000 joules per kilogram, as I said before. So what Vince did was he said, OK, let's start with the times that the severe weather occurred and work backwards with time. And so, so each of these, again, is a different episode of severe weather. He chose a point in the middle of these clusters of severe weather, and he traced air back backwards in time. Actual air trajectories, actually it was in three dimensions, but you're only seeing it on a two-dimensional map here. The red is air at 700 millibars, about three kilometers above the surface. It should ordinarily be in this desert air. And the blue is air uh, coming, is basically at the surface. So in this severe weather outbreak, if you go backwards in time, the air at the surface came from the Gulf of Mexico. The air at 700 millibars came from here, but it had to cross deserts to get here. Okay. And this is another outbreak where the air went over the upper level air, went over Mexico. Again, the low level air from the Gulf of Mexico. But you can find cases like here, and there are a few others, where the low level air didn't even come from a body of water. It came locally from a very wet, a place with very wet soils. All right, once you've done that, once you've done these trajectories, you can look at, by following the surface air, you can calculate at every point along the trajectory this convective available potential energy. So this is for this case, showing CAPE as a function of time relative to when the severe weather occurred. So that's at the end here. And what you notice, uh, and these are just different trajectories from nearby samples, is that most of the buildup of CAPE occurs in the last 10 hours or so. And this is a bit of a surprise that you, know, you don't really see these large values until you turn on the sun, OK? Uh, I guess that shouldn't be a surprise. And in fact, if you look at what's contributing to these large values, these are the different cases. This is the total CAPE tendency just by taking one observation and differentiating it from another. And then these are the contributions to that. So the radiative cooling of the free troposphere, which tends to build up CAPE, is in green. The relative advection, which is what all the textbooks, including mine, always said was the important thing, is in, is in um, red. And then this boundary layer heating is blue. And the moral of the story is almost all of the cape comes from heating the surface locally, which was a bit of a surprise. Let's now go back to, well, let, I actually haven't shown you this. This is uh, what excites me, is that all this work is happening at about the time that we're developing, as most of you know, the, the ability to estimate uh, certain metrics of soil moisture from space. And this is showing you a particular map of soil moisture around the world from April 22, 2015. The blues are very moist, the, the orange and red are dry. It's reassuring to see that the Sahara is a dry place in <laughs> western US. Okay. And um, so this is a particular snapshot. And what we do know about soil moisture is that in spite of the fact it's always going to be dry in the Sahara and probably always moist in Borneo, other than those extremes, it can be very variable in time, both from, uh, on a seasonal basis and even an interannual basis. Based on what I've just told you, where would we expect to see severe convection? First of all, we have to rule out the tropics because even if we did get large Cape values there, we don't have the other ingredient that I haven't talked about is wind shear. So let's look for extra tropical places where, you remember, winds outside the tropics are basically blowing from west to east ordinarily, where there are large west to east gradients of soil moisture. Well, here's one, OK, uh, the plains of the US. You're going from very dry soils out here in the mountain region and the desert southwest 
to quite wet ones. Now, the magnitude of that gradient, on the other hand, will vary a lot with time. Um, so that's one place where, according to this idea, we might expect to see a lot of cape. Where are some other places? You probably, those of you who are quicker, already picked them out from this map, but let's go through them. Here's another place in South America where you go from the dry pampas and the Andes to relatively wet soils, okay? Uh, so that might be another place outside the tropics where we might get severe weather or a lot of cape. This is an interesting region, Bangladesh, where you go from, in the, in the spring, very dry soils in northern India, of course, to the west you have Iraq, Iran, so forth, and, uh, but very wet in this delta region. Australia, down here, especially in the southeast. Um, Europe, I circled here, even though there aren't many great, there's not much by way of a gradient in Europe, because I suspect that in other years you might see much stronger gradients than you see now. And China, central part of China. So we'll go back to this, this uh, uh, map I used to ridicule. Uh, that's kind of showing you where the tornadoes are, okay? With the possible exception of Western Europe, China, uh, Bangladesh, southeastern Australia, the Pampas, and of course the plains of the United States. So maybe the fact that there's agriculture in this region isn't a, co a coincidence because by and large we do agriculture in places with wet soils. All right. So let me try to summarize this. Um, this is kind of a new idea. We're feeling our way through it, but uh, large uh, built up energy, stored energy tends to occur when you take dry adiabatic layers and you move them over moist soil. So we think it's much more important to move them over moist soil than to move them over moist air, okay? That's the new thing. And that's where there might be a connection to agriculture. Uh, the peak value of the Cape over the course of a day is approximately proportional to the difference between the wet and dry bulb temperatures and that increases exponentially with temperature. So um, there's something I should have told you that's very important along the way I, I didn't tell you that, and that is that the potential barrier to convection, the so-called convective inhibition, also increases exponentially with temperature. So although you're building up much more energy, you're also building it up over, behind a much larger barrier. Nevertheless, over the course of the day, uh, you get much larger capes this way. Um, if you impose a diurnal cycle, you limit the growth of peak cape with surface temperature. Nevertheless, peak cape increases with surface wind speed and soil moisture, which is kind of an interesting finding, I think. And uh, I didn't say this before, but this is, I think, perhaps the most important point I want to tell this audience, and that is that this dependence of cape on soil moisture offers us an opportunity, an opportunity that could be realized with the appropriate measurements. We might even uh, be able to say something for the first time, because we certainly can't do it now. Um, we, can, we might be able to make seasonal predictions of severe weather. I don't actually mean obviously you know, where and when severe storms will occur, but similar to what we do with hurricanes, is it going to be an active season? tornado season in the United States this year or not. And the hope comes from the fact that soil moisture uh, doesn't change usually overnight. Uh, it, it does change over days and weeks. If we can monitor that, especially if we can monitor it from space, which is really necessary, I would argue, because soil moisture is spatially very inhomogeneous in many places. Um, if we knew that you had strong gradients of soil moisture now at the end of March, I don't know that that's true, by the way, but if we knew it was true, we might be able to say there's a higher than a normal probability that the coming severe weather season will be a bad one. And conversely, if it's not very much, we might say it isn't. That's just pure speculation on my part. But I think that's the next step to take. So one last point is that the fact that uh, there is this dependence of soil moisture might yield multiple equilibria. The soil moisture is strongly affected by precipitation, including precipitation from stored energy convection. So there are feedbacks in the system that might also affect its climatology. 
So uh, I will leave you with those thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so we will open up for questions. And just as a reminder, wait till the mics get to you. We have a brown mic that side, an orange mic that side, I think. Is that right? OK, so questions for anyone. Brian. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gary. A fascinating talk. Um, is there a possible interplay between the quasi-equilibrium convection and the stored energy convection, convection in the sense that the quasi-equilibrium convection may prime or set the stage for, in the coming days, the stored energy convection through, through the soil moisture? Uh, well, in a, in a certain way, it does. Yes, I mean, if you have, for example, um, a regime where you have a lot of quasi-equilibrium convection going on, let's just be US-centric for a minute and say over the plain states, um, or a season of a lot of convection that, that made the soils very wet, and an absence of moist convection to the west, that could very well help set the stage. It's a good point. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, uh, we'll take um, Lee, Lee, and then. Um, yeah, uh, your title, you talk about climate, and I didn't quite sense the, uh, you, you know, what's your opinion about the, the connection to climate change. Right. So the connection to climate change here. Um, I think, first of all, to step back from it, it's important to understand there are two ingredients, very broadly speaking, to get severe weather. One is a lot of cape, which is what I did talk about, and the other is a lot of wind shear, which I didn't talk about. But if we look at that one ingredient, what this suggests is that peak cape values go up with temperature. So all the things being equal, if you warm the climate, uh, you should have larger peak capes, which would give you more severe convective storms, all of the things being equal. Now, um, that doesn't say you'd have more storms, on the other hand. You might actually have fewer, uh, because the convective inhibition is also larger. But those storms that did develop would have stronger updrafts and more violent, you know, bigger hailstones, that sort of thing. That's the idea. It doesn't pretend to be a complete picture of the problem, because we also have to say what's going on with wind shear. There was an article in the Los Angeles Times last Saturday. And it mentioned that climate change seems to be related to extreme events. The idea is that the Arctic is warming, and you take the differential of the heat and the cold, and if there's not enough, if there's not enough differential, things are really different. And I've heard Jennifer Francis talk this way with her colleagues, but what is, what is the status of this issue? So you raise an interesting question. When we um, talk about extreme events, it's easy to slip into putting them all in one pot. But in fact, they're very different. So tornadoes, the whole physics of tornadoes is entirely different, for example, from the physics of hurricanes. And they're both very different from the kinds of blizzards that, unfortunately, people like me have been through a lot of in the last few months in the Northeast. And so um, scientifically, in some sense, you have to treat these separately. And you're talking about. Um, you know, why is it that we seem to be having uh, much more extremes in temperature and snow in places like the Northeast, which is a problem that Jennifer Francis tackled. And um, that's a whole different problem unrelated to what I've been talking about today, except that they're both perhaps consequences of, of uh, global temperature change. We've got one there. Uh, We've got about four questions, five questions, so you'll start there. Okay. Uh, people also uh, classify convection into organized and unorganized, and how these connect or overlap with your classification of stored and what, uh, uh, equilibrium? Yeah, that's an excellent question. The question's about the sort of spatial, temporal organization of convection. Um, the 
quasi-equilibrium convection, which is you know, 95 or 98 percent of all convection, right, uh, can assume all kinds of different organizational forms, squall lines, mesoscale clusters. And um, that depends very much on the wind profile in the atmosphere. So squall lines tend to occur when you have lots of low-level wind shear. Uh, clusters occur when you're at high temperature, particularly over the ocean, and that's their cloud radiation feedbacks, and there's not much wind shear. So th that's true. Now, the, um, if you have a lot of CAPE and you don't have wind shear, you tend to have very short-lived storms that may produce flash floods produce a hell of a lot of rain over a short time, and then they'll go away, and another one will pop up somewhere. If you have a lot of wind shear, you get the organization into something called supercell convection, which is a highly organized form of convection, organized on the convective scale. Uh, you get these rotating thunderstorms. These are the ones that produce so much hail and tornadoes. So yeah, there, uh, there, there are organizational questions in both cases. Eric. Yeah, can you go back to your plot, the blue and red? The blue and, blue and uh, red Blue and plot. red maps, the, the trajectory plots. Uh, I, th I thought this was a science talk. You're asking me for a political chart. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's see. <laughs> the trajectory maps. Okay. Yes, please. Um, I'm sure there's a more efficient way to do it than this. I think this is the one you mean, yes? Is that it? Oh, it doesn't show up anymore. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> OK. I think I can make this show up, too. Oh, there we are. That one? OK, yeah. so, um, so in the majority of these plots, the blue dots are surface, and they're coming from the yes. Gulf of Mexico. Yep. And they're, they're underlying advected air from central Mexico or yep. places west. Yep. How does that differ from the map from your book that, that um, you said was not the correct synoptic picture? At, li at last, somebody's defending my book. <laughs> OK, I think this is the clincher here. It's, it's this one. If you actually look at the cape um, of this air, this is this case. So we're following these trajectories uh, at low levels as they move up into the region where the severe weather occurred. And we're calculating their cape, OK? And this soaring cape. Uh, uh, it turns out, if you actually look at the physics behind it, so you need more than this chart to demonstrate this point, is coming from the sun. It's not coming from the superposition. So that was this okay. next um, map, OK? The, this is for each case. This is the, uh, the sunlight effect is the blue. The superposition effect is the red, OK? That's, that's the okay. basis of it. Yeah. Okay. Mic to mic. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous figure? Because my question was about that one too. Okay. Okay. So, so given that I don't believe soil moisture changes much over the course of the day, yeah. but planetary boundary layer thickness does. Yeah. And given that in this figure shows moist air is getting advected into the boundary layer, could the really valuable measurement be boundary layer total precipitable water and free atmospheric? Precipitable water, the fact that you get this large discontinuity in the mass of water in the boundary layer versus the mass of water in the free atmosphere. And could that be a measurement that we could provide that's that right. might be that might be useful? That's an excellent idea. So if you simply wanted to know whether you were getting large values of CAPE and you didn't particularly care why you were getting them, that would be a very valuable in, in some sense it's a proxy for soil moisture. But so, so yeah. what you're saying is soil moisture is a, is a possible mechanism yeah. for moistening the boundary, yes. but, but it's not the only one. No, it isn't. It, that's right. And this, again, going back to the next chart, this is our attempt to quantify that, although it's a bit indirect. The part that comes from advecting water in from the side is this red part. The part that get, comes in from the bottom, in some sense, is the blue part. But, yeah. but it's also yeah. true that you can't have a moist boundary layer you have dry, I mean, if you, you, can't, have a, you no. can't have moist soil moisture if you have a dry atmosphere above it. You well, you can transiently, what? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you're talking about time scale of 24 hours, you absolutely can do that. You can advect dry air over a wet soil. I mean, in a long-term climatology, you're right, you can't do that. But it happens transiently all the time. Yeah. Two more questions. Um, one from Anthony. Uh, can I, yes. Um, 
solar energy is a key ingredient in your, in your thinking and modeling. Um, and in the presence of uh, this kind of convective cloud, solar energy gets the distribution, the spatial and temporal yeah. distribution gets really complicated. Yes, it does. Uh, and so could you elaborate on a little sure. on, the, on the kind of temporal and spatial scales you need to do it right? So this is an interesting question, which we have thought about. In, in some sense, and I might have made this clear, a study is what happens up to the time a big convective cloud forms. So we're interested in how you store up all that energy. Conceptually, it could happen under clear sky conditions. The thing you worry about that could spoil this are boundary layer clouds. So if it's too wet, and this is not in this model, if it's too wet, you're going to get stratus or stratocumulus at the top of the boundary layer, which will shut down the sunlight. And so that's a very good point, and we have to think about that more. And that does happen. Yeah. Last question. Um, Mike. Uh, thank you, Carrie. A topic that you sometimes lecture on is the damage, uh, property damage from uh, hurricanes and extreme events. Can you give us some sense of what we expect the uh, property damage potential to be as CAPE goes up from it, its typical nominal values of three to 6,000 to values uh, up to 10,000 in this warming, warming climate scenario? I presume the, yeah. a one centimeter hail, hailstone is a lot less damaging than a three centimeter hailstone. Yeah, you, that's, you're very forward thinking. I mean, that's a, I, that's a very good direction that we should go in, but I think there are a number of other problems we have to solve before we do that. Our experience with uh, storm damage, particularly wind damage, but I'm sure it's true of hail, is it, it goes up very rapidly with the intensity of the event. So yes, a three, three centimeter hailstone is going to be a lot more damaging than one centimeter. But then there's the issue of the frequency of the events. And nothing I've told you here today really says anything one way or the other about the frequency of events or their geographical distribution. Well, areas of prone to tornadoes and hail shift poleward, uh, eastward. So there's a lot of work to do. But I think ultimately, I mean, my ambition and the one that you sort of pointed out is, is to bring physics to bear on the important problem of estimating natural hazard risk, full stop, whether climate changes or not. It's way too important of a problem to, to leave to actuarial approaches, and we don't have very long or very good histories of these events. So let's do it right. Let's, let's use physical modeling to help inform uh, quantitative estimates of risk. And we're not there yet in se severe storms, but we're doing it with hurricanes. Okay. Well, I think we'll thank Kerry once again. Um, yeah, so any other announcements? No. Okay. Thank you.